everyone, this is Juan from Salmonella Place, and today we're going to be talking about enzyme regulation. So we have learned already here on Salmonella Place what are enzymes. Now a very important and very complicated topic, but I try to simplify as much as I can, is enzyme regulation. And what is this? So the first thing that I want to tell you about, a uh, quick review on enzymes, uh, these are biocatalysts, which are proteins that increase rates of reaction. So this is what enzymes really are. Now, when we talk about regulation, so is when these enzymes, these proteins, are activated or inhibited. In other words, how they are switched on or switched off. And this is how what we're going to learn in this tutorial here. We're going to learn how these uh, enzymes, these proteins, can be regulated in this manner. Now, a few things that we need to discuss, a few concepts that we need to look at before we talk about regulation, and so you can understand how enzymes are activated and inhibited. Uh, these concepts are feedback inhibition, allosteric regulation, phosphorylation, and we're going to look at some molecules that help enzymes or that influence somehow regulation. The first concept I would like to discuss is known as feedback inhibition. And this is simply when the product of a pathway is going to inhibit a particular enzyme. And in order for us to understand this a little bit more, I have an example of one pathway here, one of many that are happening in your cells. And this is when you go from threonine to isoleucine. So the first thing that is going to happen, threonine is going to become alpha-ketobutyrate through this enzyme here, threonine deaminase. And what happens after a few other steps, it will become isoleucine. Now what isoleucine does is it inhibits the activity of threonine deaminase. So it will inhibit the activity of threonine deaminase. And this is a very smart way that cells came up in order to save some energy because if this pathway is going, occurring, and then you produce enough amount of isoleucine that you need, then the smart thing to do is stop production. So the way cells found to do, a way that cells found to do that is through feedback inhibition. That way this product will tell threonine deaminase to stop working and this step here then is stopped and the whole pathway will stop for a little bit until isoleucine is needed again. The second type of regulation that I would like to discuss is allosteric regulation. And if we look at a little bit of word origin, I can tell you this has Greek origin. And allo means other, and steric means object. So other object or shape. So it means that the enzyme will suffer some sort of change in shape which will allow regulation or turning on or off. And we have here an example of this type of allosteric regulation. This is an allosteric inhibition. So I'm switching off the enzyme. And what I have here is an enzyme in these three steps here, as you can see here also. And I will have an, an inhibitor or a molecule that will bind to the allosteric site, which is a site other than the active site that you see here, where the substrate is supposed to bind. So this inhibitor will bind to this allosteric site and will influence, let's say, this enzyme to change the shape of the active site, as you can see here. And when it does, it will not allow now this substrate 
to bind. So the substrate is not able now to bind to the active site. So this is a form of allosteric regulation. The enzyme is able to inhibit or to or to switch off, let's say, uh, by changing its shape. Now, there is also ways that it can be activated in the same manner. So uh, the enzyme will change its shape so it can fit the substrate, so it can uh, help in the reaction. Another way enzymes can be regulated is through phosphorylation. And this is done when you add a phosphate group to one of the amino acids, one or more amino acids of the enzymes, and this will either inactivate or activate the enzyme. Now, an example of this is when muscle cells are in the presence of epinephrine or adrenaline, also known as adrenaline. What happens is there will be a pathway that will then enforce glycogen to break down into smaller parts such as glucose for, of course, energy. Now, the important thing here, the important lesson to take from this example, is that glycogen phosphorylase, this enzyme that will help glycogen break down into glucose, is usually found, or at this point, is found in the inactive state. Now, once epinephrine is in the cells, what's going to happen is uh, phosphorylase kinase, this other enzyme will add a phosphate group here to our glycogen phosphorylase. And now once this phosphate group is added into the glycogen phosphorylase, now it's active. And once it's active, then glycogen can go into glucose one phosphate and of course now to glucose until it's in the energy form that the body needs. Now an important thing to know also is that enzymes can be regulated or can be aided or helped with regulation uh, through molecules that will partner with them and help usually activate them. And there are three examples that we need to talk about. The first one is cofactors, which are inorganic ions that bind to certain enzymes, such as iron, copper, and zinc. The other one is coenzymes, which are carbon-containing molecules, usually smaller than the actual enzymes, but these coenzymes will bind to the, uh, the main enzymes and help them perform their, their function. Now usually coenzymes are either vitamins or biotin, coenzyme A, NAD, and FAD. Now the last one, last group is prosthetic groups which are usually permanently bound to their enzymes and examples of that are the heme group. Um, if you remember well this is the the group that is attached to the oxygen carrying protein in your blood the hemoglobin hence the name heme and of course flavin and retinol. After learning all those concepts of how enzymes can be regulated, now we can say that enzymes can be activated or switched on or switched on, sorry, in three ways. The first one is through partner molecules. Uh, the second one is phosphorylation, and the last one, allosteric regulation. Now moving on to inhibition or switching off of an enzyme, there are two subcategories that we need to talk about and these are competitive and non-competitive inhibition. Now for competitive inhibition, I have a drawing here that illustrates what this is. And if you look here at inhibition, competitive means that there is going to be a molecule right here, that is going to bind to the active site and compete 
with the actual substrate. So this molecule will prevent the substrate from binding to the active site. So this is competitive inhibition. Now an example of that, not an example, but an actual thing that we need to add is that feedback inhibition can be subdivided into two and if it fits into the category of competitive inhibition then we're going to have an active feedback inhibition and what this is is the product of a reaction will compete for that space that we just looked at so the product will compete for the active active site and bind to it and prevent from other uh, reactants, other substrates from binding to it and proceeding with the reaction. So this is a form of competitive inhibition known as active feedback inhibition. Now the non-competitive inhibition, like the name says, there is not going to be competition for that active site. Instead, there are going to be other parts of the enzyme that will influence whether it's switched on or in this case off. Now one type is passive feedback inhibition, the opposite of fee active feedback inhibition, and this means that the product of a reaction will bind somewhere, usually an allosteric site, in the enzyme, on the enzyme, and that way we'll switch it off, and this is passive feedback inhibition. Now the second type then will be allosteric, and the third and final one, phosphorylation, another type of non-competitive inhibition. Mm -hmm.